morning. We are still in uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, thinking about uh, the works of the flesh. I have to admit that um, seeing the pictures from Virginia and Kentucky this morning, I'm thankful to be here. Uh, they, they've got quite a bit of snow, and I, I don't like snow. I like the warmer weather. It was cold riding this morning uh, with that wind, but uh, thinking about jealousy and how it is, A, a work of the flesh, one of the obvious works of the flesh, as Paul listed, but also we want to think about how jealousy impacts us, how it is a work of the flesh. Uh, I, I think too often when it comes to works of the flesh, you, you know, when we get to the fruit of the Spirit, we, we stop and we dissect them and, and we think about uh, how the Spirit adds these qualities to our lives. But with the works of the flesh, I think too often we just read over them. Um, maybe because they make us uncomfortable when you start talking about sexual morality and things of that sort. Um, and then some of, the, some of it hits rather close to home, if we're honest. Uh, when you start talking about jealousy and envy and arrogance and so forth, uh, it's wise for us to think about uh, the contrast that Paul is making between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Why would jealousy be listed as a work of the flesh? Jealousy of neighbor, uh, wanting what he has, is most definitely a work of the flesh. I see two other hands. Jealousy can only exist in the flesh. Jealousy is a curse of the flesh. In the spirit, we are complete. It Nothing missing. There's no room for jealousy there. Jimmy, you're going to say... Jealousy places us in the center of the universe. Uh, you know, I have to have what so-and-so has. Uh, what I have, the things with which God has blessed me, not good enough for me. Uh, but I have to have more. God is a jealous God. Jealousy is a word that does depend on the context, whether it is good or bad. Um, actually, the next work of the flesh, uh, fits of rage. 
uh, God is quote unquote guilty of work of uh, not work of flesh, obviously, but of fits of rage. That's what I meant to say. Uh, there are places in Scripture where God has a fit of rage, and it is even the word in Greek is applied to God uh, in some text. Jealousy is the same way. Paul said that he was jealous. Paul said that he was jealous to present the Corinthians as a pure virgin to Christ. And so jealousy can be good. How can jealousy be good if it's a work of the flesh? Richard has pointed out that um, Scripture says be angry, sin not. Anger in and of itself, there's nothing good or bad about it. It is simply an emotion. Uh, and I, I think we do have to recognize emotions aren't good or bad. They're just what you feel. All right? And I do think that jealous is, as Richard's pointed out, just an emotion. Uh, there's nothing good or bad about it. Uh, it is neither negative or positive, that emotion. It's how we respond to it. Okay, it, It's the response to that stimulus that makes it good or bad. Um, God is a jealous God, there is a place for husbands and wives to be jealous. There is a place for parents to be jealous of their children, uh, meaning, you know, I want to train them. I want to take care of them. Uh, there, are, there are ways that that's healthy, but yet it's how we respond to that. Um, Jealousy as a work of the flesh is about me. It is not about the other person. Jealous in a good way, I would say, is about the other person. Uh, God is jealous for us because He wants us to worship Him. He is worthy of that. And he also understands that is for our own good, as he is a jealous God. Um, you know, jealous of a husband, wife, in a healthy way, uh, wanting that union to continue, a healthy thing, uh, and, and so forth. Mary, before that discussion, I saw you had your hand up. I just didn't get to you. When sin, when jealousy goes to extreme and brings about other sins, uh, it can bring about murder. Uh, Tammy and I were watching 2020 last night, and um, Peggy knows this about me, but I like murder shows, those real life murder shows. Um, so it, 
you know, I, I just try to keep Tammy on her toes, nervous, and doing what I ask her to do. Um, <laughs> not good, not well. Um, uh, anyway, seriously, I, you know, I, I enjoy that. And, and anyhow, one of the comments last night, they were interviewing a detective, and he said, or maybe it was a news reporter, I, 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 but anyhow, the comment was made with a murder, there is always a storyline. What happened? How did this come to be? And it is not at all uncommon to watch one of those shows and see jealousy as part of it. Yeah, not uncommon at all. Um, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's money or other things, but jealousy. Uh, and money can play a part in jealousy. Jealousy into money. Uh, most certainly. You got it. I want. It, I'm going to steal it. That, that's exactly the case. Um, I was waiting for somebody to point that out, Peggy. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, his his donkey, his property. But basically, that's that's the the, the gist of it. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his property. Don't desire what your neighbor's. Don't be jealous of him, in other words, and want what he has. Uh, Paul tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Uh, jealousy is the exact opposite of that. I can't be happy for you because I want what you have. And... Um, we need to be very, very careful about that. What's wrong with jealousy? We've answered that question. Our Coveting and jealousy first cousins, um, they may be closer than that. But yes, brother, sister, yes, they're very close together. Um, they're not exactly the same thing. Um, coveting goes to possessions. Jealousy goes to the person. Uh, but more or less, they are very, very similar. Um, jealousy leads to coveting, as, as I think you said, uh, most certainly. We've mentioned the possibility of murder. Um, I don't think we've ever considered murdering somebody. But yet, at the same time, we've experienced other negative consequences of jealousy. What are some of the other negative consequences of jealousy? Damaged relationships? Jealousy drives you to do harm yourself and other people. There is a truth about sin, and that is that sin leads to other sin. Okay, it's I, I think of Peter at in the garden warming himself at the fire. Before that, the arrogant, the boasting, Lord, I'll never deny you, rejecting the word of Jesus, so forth, sets him up to fall in a big way. And um, sin is progressive. You don't just commit sin and stop there. You keep going. And jealousy certainly plays into that. You become jealous, you start committing other sins. What other consequences does jealousy have? 
loss of your soul, that is the consequence that Paul mentions here in the context. Uh, those who do such shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, will be the loss of soul if we're jealous. Um, and have jealousy in our heart. Joseph sold into slavery because of jealousy. Uh, here comes that dreamer with his coat of many colors. And uh, you recall only the intervention of Reuben prevented his being killed. Uh, the brothers wanted to kill him. Reuben kept that from happening. Jacob had a huge difference between Joseph and his brothers. Um, I, uh, as a side note, but an important one, uh, Isaac and Rebekah made a big, big difference between Jacob and Esau. Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau. So when Jacob grows up and has his own kids, what's he do? Same thing. He has a favorite and really dotes on that favorite. Uh, and he, then Joseph began having his strange dreams about sheep and planets falling down to him. Now here's something about Joseph. Uh, not his fault he had the dreams, just like it's really not your fault if you have a jealous fault. I mean, that's just uh, Martin Luther. The reformer said, you know, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep building a nest in your hair. And, and I think that's a good description of temptation. That's what he's talking about. Um, Joseph couldn't keep the dreams from coming, but he didn't have to open his mouth and brag about them either. And uh, he is a braggart. Hey, look at me, I'm having these dreams. Y'all are going to bow down to me. Um, Jacob, of course, and Joseph discover how the brothers are doing. The brothers find them distant. Here comes that dreamer, Genesis 37, 19 and 20. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and see that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Uh, only Reuben prevented that from happening. What damage does jealousy do in the church? Brings about division. Um, you are now acting the flesh. Paul says to the Corinthians, where there is jealousy and so forth, you're acting like mere mortals. You're in the flesh. First Corinthians 3, he, he connects, you know, acting with jealousy. Uh, to the flesh. Um, mere human. Simply as, as humans. Um, we are human. We don't have to act that way. You know. Uh, we are... No, go ahead. Jealousy becomes justification for sin. Um, that's very true. Very true. Hey, uh, I can do this because look at so-and-so. Um, Jimmy? Jealousy. 
Jealousy burns mental energy. We do not have it to burn, and um, that, that, that's very true. It is a cancer. It attacks itself. Yes. Right. Right. Um, what are some examples from Scripture? Let's go there first. Uh, of jealousy in the church. Brian's pointed out 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. You know, hand can't be jealous of the foot, vice versa, eye can't be jealous of the hand, and so forth. What are some other examples? Relationships. Relationships in the church can greatly be damaged by jealousy. They were in the early church. They can be today. Uh, human nature hasn't changed. Uh, somebody mentioned Cain and Abel. I mean, the same thing we have today for all those times that years ago. Um, Yes. Bitterness is, I think, largely a result of jealousy. I think you're exactly right. Uh, and anger. One of the biblical examples I keep thinking about, Anais and Sapphira, how jealous they were of the accolades others were getting by bringing uh, proceeds of sales, laying them at the apostles' feet. And they had to have the same thing. And, um, you know, they could have given a tenth for the sale if they'd wanted to. There was no obligation to sell the property. There was no obligation to give all of it. They could easily have given whatever they gave. Uh, and said, you know, this is part of the proceed. And we would never even know their names. Uh, but yet, the cause of jealousy and wanting 
pat on the back. They lied to the Holy Spirit and died. You've got, of course, more famous examples, uh, easier examples to, to think of, at least for me. Uh, you've got uh, preachers of Corinth, uh, jealousy the people had over who preached better, um, diatrophies. Jealousy, I believe, is the root of discord. Yes, very much so. Example of jealousy you've seen in the church, we've somewhat answered that. What damage does jealousy do in the home? Jealousy on the part of the parents can cause children to take sides. You do see that, I believe, in the case of Jacob and Esau, where they did take sides. You know, Jacob was mama's boy. Esau was daddy's boy. Nothing wrong of that in and of itself. It was how it all played out and how they allowed it to play out. From their hearts. Jealousy causes big time division in the home. Jealousy is a half step from hatred. And you go to hatred really fast. Real fast. Saul to David. Uh, you know, here David comes back from battle, and everybody's giving David accolades, and they're not giving Saul accolades. And uh, Saul becomes very angry. And uh, it is his son in law. It cost him big time. Big time. Like case of jealousy can cause this in the end. Most certainly. How do we keep from being jealous? Put other people first. That is the key. Have a servant mentality. Paul talks about in Philippians 2. To consider others better than yourself. And to serve. Yes, it does go back to rejoicing uh, with those who rejoice. Anything else you want to say about jealousy? There is a lot to learn from the Old Testament and New um, about jealousy. Um, you look at the history of the kings. 
it's often a case of jealousy. Um, Jezebel, jealous of Elijah. Um, and on and on you can go. Every every work of the flesh can be driven by jealousy. That is very true. Very true. Fits of rage. Uh, Galatians 5.20 Galatians 5.19-21 The acts of flesh are obvious, sexual morality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Greek term means to boil over. Idea of boiling over with anger. It is not becoming angry. This act of the flesh is not anger. Okay, it's fit of rage. Uh, be angry and do not sin. Scripture does not say don't be angry. Uh, but yet it tells us how to be angry. And there is a big, big uh, difference. Here are just some examples of how the Greek term is used in the New Testament. Uh, Luke 4.28 All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Acts 19.28 When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Romans 2.8 Here's a case where God has fits of rage. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Ephesians 4.31 Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice, if anger is not in and of itself wrong, why get rid of it? It leads to the other. Okay? We've got to keep, you know, there's nothing wrong with emotion. You read the Psalms, you find that out real fast. Okay? I mean, they really argue with God sometimes. Uh, but it can lead to the other. Thank you. Uncontrolled anger is rage. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And God is has uncontrolled anger. Okay? Um, the word doesn't appear uh, in the text from Hebrews, but I think is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And uh, Romans 2 8, there will be wrath, there will be this all consuming rage on those who follow evil and reject the truth. Hebrews eleven twenty seven, 27, uh, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Uh, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Revelation 12.12 12, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. The overwhelming majority of this Greek term occurs in the book of Revelation. About half uh, occur in Revelation and often referring to the serpent. 
uh, to Satan, to the devil um, there. Used in three different ways. God's wrath, Satan's wrath, man's wrath. That's how uh, the word uh, thumos is used. What is the difference between God's wrath, Satan's wrath, and man's wrath? Only one is justified. Which one is that? <laughs> Mine. That's how we often think, isn't it? Seriously. That's how we often think. Of course, God is justified. Um, Satan and man is not. Man has justifiable anger. Jesus had justifiable anger. Um, but he handled it appropriately. Although I don't think everybody around him would have thought that. Uh, you know, being beaten out of the temple, uh, probably those folks probably didn't think Jesus was very justified. Uh, but yet... What other people think doesn't matter in that context. If God has fits of rage, how can fits of rage be walking the flesh? What did Rich just say? One is justified. One is justified. Um... What are some examples in the past? Now, in Romans, Paul is talking about the future. There will be fits of rage. Um, but what are some examples from the past of God's fits of rage? He certainly did. He, God did have fits of rage around the Ten Commandments. I uh, wanted to destroy the people. Make of Moses a great nation. They grumbled, they complained. God sent destroyers among them. Serpents. Plagues. Uh, God would break out and consume his people at times. Um... Jesus was certainly angry. And when he, when he goes in the temple and sees what's going on, then he goes outside and makes a whip. Okay? It is premeditated rage that he goes in and does. You know, um, back to the murder shows, you do that, that's premeditated murder. Uh, you know, you, you go and you fashion something and, and you've got time to think about it and, and so forth. The Lord's thinking about what he's fixing to do. Uh, this was not just fly off the handle. The Lord goes and, and uh, takes care of business in his anger, so to speak. You had your hand up. When Moses struck the rock, that's certainly, I think, a fit of rage on God's part. You're not, I mean, you almost feel sorry for Moses. You really do, I, or at least I do. I mean, here he had put up with these grumblers and these complainers, and they're grumbling about not having enough water. And he goes and he hits the rock, and I don't believe, I that God kept him out of the promised land because he hit the rock. I know that's contrary to what God said, but I don't believe that 
in and of itself was what kept him from the promised land. I believe what kept him from the promised land is must we bring water for you from this rock? I mean, the arrogance of Moses there. I'm doing this. And he doesn't give credit to God. And I, and I think that's what God said, you're not going to the promised land for. Um, now, Rage always has consequences. It has bad negative consequences for somebody. God's fits of rage have bad negative consequences. You better believe it. Um, if we're going to just stay with the children of Israel, I mean, the spies go in, the scouts go in, they come back, no one over 20 gets to go in the promised land, um, except Caleb and Joshua. Um, Moses doesn't get to enter it. You've got the serpents. You have the plague. Um... You have a plague in the days of David because of David's sin. Now think about that. God breaks out and sends a plague upon the people because the king sinned. Not because they did. Because the king did. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Flood. Um, God would command... Uh, when the children of Israel went into, into the promised land, what did God command the people to do? Kill everybody, right? I mean, even the children were commanded to be killed. Um, people didn't do that completely, as you know, and caused all sorts of problems, caused God to break out in rage and uh, captivity and uh, exile. And... Um, God has a long history of breaking out in the rain. Long history of doing so. And Paul says that the things that happen to them happen by way of example for us. And we need to learn those lessons. God is not simply a friendly God. God is not simply a loving God. God is not one-dimensional. We are not one-dimensional. Okay? Uh, and God is certainly not. And too often, I believe, some religious groups and even some of our brethren want to emphasize one part of God or the other. You know, I've known brethren to emphasize the love part against the justice. And I've known people to emphasize the justice as opposed to the love. It's not one or the other. It's who God is. He is both. And so much more than simply those two qualities, of course. And um, we will pick up here next week if the Lord so wills.